Okay, first things first, how do you get an agent? I don't know. Um, I mean, are, is this mostly people that are oriented towards writing or acting? I don't, I'm not sure who I'm talking to. Writers. Well, okay, how you get an agent is you, you write something to the end, which an agent will want to represent because he can make 10% off it. You know, you don't think about agents until you have written something all the way. Um, if you're unknown, you're unknown. And that's the biggest piece of wisdom I have. Um, basically, how I started, I, I grew up in the Bronx in a housing project. You know, I was doing research for The Wire in 1950-something. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I just, I wanted to be a writer, you know, just because, like, everybody, when you're an adolescent or even younger than that, everybody feels you, like you got to have a specialty. You know, like you have to have the best hair or be the best dancer or the toughest fighter, you know, or the math brain or whatever. And uh, my grandfather was a writer. He was a factory worker in Brooklyn, but um, he used to write poems, and it would be published in a YMHA journal on mimeograph paper. Now, 90% of you probably never even heard of the word mimeograph. <laughs> um, carbon copy, anybody hear that? Um, and uh, when I was a kid, I would see his poems, which were not very good, but what I, I was like eight years old. And... Uh, I'd see him in print, and I'd see his name, and I decided I want to do that because my father would look at his father, you know, with this um, adulation and awe, um, and I wanted to get some of that. So, <laughs> honestly, uh, you know, like I always said, I'm just glad my grandfather wasn't a professional wrestler or, you know, <laughs> an opera singer or something. So, you know, I just decided, okay, that's going to be me. And... You know, just to keep my head above water as a kid and as an adolescent and not totally feel self-revulsed, I worked on that as my specialty. And sure enough, I became known as uh, the writer. I had no interest whatsoever in content. I just wanted people to know me as the writer. <laughs> I wanted to be able to walk into a cafeteria where there were girls and they'd go to a table and there'd be like one girl over here, one girl over there, and I wanted to be the guy that would sit in the middle of the table and pinch his brow like this, <laughs> you know. And I, I had no idea what to write. I re, I, I'm writing like, do, do I remember all the Milwaukee Braves? Let me write them, you know. You know but I'm like trying to go all Rambo on them. And, you know, it's, it's all I cared about is the label. I was so much more into the rapping than the gif. And I, I pursued that. I also loved to write, but it was also very tied up in ego, and it was very tied up in what people thought about me. It wasn't until I went all the way through college. Um, well, I mean, coming from the Bronx, I, I went to Cornell in upstate New York, and I, I never, I thought a wasp was a thing that stung you. I mean, I, you know, uh, you know, and it was like, I felt so, you know, you know, out of my element. And what people do when they get nervous and they're out of their element is sometimes they come on twice as heavy from the, from the place that they're coming from uh, than they were in that place. So I developed a Bronx accent that I never had in the Bronx. You know, I had t telling people stories about the housing projects, which were pretty good blue-collar knockabout places. They were, you know, they were fine. And, uh, but making people so scared of the projects that, I mean, I had two friends that were going to come home my freshman year for, for Thanksgiving, and one guy lived on, on the east, Upper East Side, and the other guy lived in, uh, I don't even know, you know where, you know, like up, you know, Upper Moneyville or something. And <laughs> all, apparently, on the way to my house, they were both so scared that they started vomiting. <laughs> and they never came to the house, which is good, because they would have been very disappointed. I had a nice mom and a nice dad and TVs, and, you know, it's just like a normal life. But, you know, I started making stuff up like that about my child. And part of, like, trying to hold my head up at, at Cornell and is I started writing about the Bronx, which I had never done before. And so I started writing these little poems, you know, romanticizing how down and dirty my family was. It wasn't that down and dirty. It was a bunch of schleppers. And um, it got worse because after that I went to, to Stanford, and I'd never left New York State in my life. And now I'm, now I'm in, like, Silicon Valley, and I'm taking writing, a two-hour writing class a week, and that's it. I have nothing else to do, you know, except get, you know, eucalyptus needles puncturing your tires every two seconds. Um, and don't try to um, bicycle drunk f 
from Palo Alto to San Francisco, Francisco <laughs> to get a tattoo at 2 in the morning. That's when, thank God for eucalyptus pines. All right, but once I was there, the, I'm joking around, but once I was there, I felt so out of my element that I really needed to write about the Bronx. I really, for the first time in my life, I really needed, I had a story and an urgency in me. I knew I was never going to go back to the Bronx. Not that the Bronx was good or bad, but that part of my life was over. And then I realized it will only survive as my memory. And I had this desire to make it, all my memories crystallize. And uh, I needed to write. And that was the first time I ever wrote anything longer than six or seven pages my whole life. And I was like in my, my early 20s. But I, the, the thing with writing is, is that you got to get past the writing part and start thinking the storytelling part. You got to feel like I have a story I desperately need to tell. And when you have that urgency and then you start doing that, then you're a writer, a real writer, not you know, a label. You know, um, until you find your story, be it in a screenplay or, or in a short story or whatever, whatever you know, your medium is, until you have urgency about what you want to write, you're never going to know how good you are. And you're never going to know how good you can be. You have a very fine sense of dialogue. How do you approach sitting down and writing a line? What actually is your thought uh, process? I, I, just go in, you know, it's, I go into improv. I have a scene, or two, two or three people talking in a scene. I know what the, the point of the scene is, and I know where they want to end. And then, you know, I, I, just, I just freestyle. And I, I'm talking to myself. I'm gesturing. You know, it, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, like the, you know, one of the girls in the crucible. But, I mean, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I actively engage. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like I, I got to get lost. Now, the thing, interesting about dialogue, it's not like, Oh, I mean, wow, you nailed these guys perfectly. Did you take notes? No, it, it, it's a little bit like this. Um, if you, you've heard George Bush enough in the last, you know, couple of years, and you're not really paying that much attention to how he talks, you know, but if somebody said to you, all right, here's a writing exercise. Um, you're George Bush. Um, uh, writing, uh, speaking a critique of Macbeth. You could do it, as long as you knew Macbeth. Um, you know, and you could, you could do George Bush. Everybody in this room could do George Bush. You know, um, it's, I get, it's not like what they said verbatim. It's just you, you listen to people, you pick up the rhythm and, 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 uh, the, and the metabolism that comes out through their words. Every occupation, uh, every race, every uh, class, Every subsection of the city, everybody has their own way. Cops have sort of a different type of humor than kids in the projects, uh, who have a different type of humor than you know professors. You know, and uh, for me, it's like you just hang out a little bit, but it's not like you memorize anything. You just let yourself relax and let the people get under your skin, and then you and then you go home and you improv. And it doesn't. You can have them talking about stuff they weren't talking about last night, but it, if you just allow yourself to empathize and open up a little bit. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I tell the story all the time, you know, this, this whole, like, you know, uh, proactive, you know, screenwriting, the dialogue approach. Oh, and by the way, dialogue is not that important in a screenplay. Everybody thinks it is because that's what you read. The most important thing in a screenplay is structure. The most important, the actors will give you good dialogue. I mean, you write, you, you write stilted, wooden writing, but it's an interesting story that's, that's shaped like a pyramid. You know, you got four characters. And you got 120 minutes, and they all converge at the top of the pyramid in 120 pages. So you can keep momentum is very important. And you could write the most wooden, who do you think you are anyhow, dialogue. And you know, if, if you're so lucky as an actor is going to finally read it, the actor is going to say, I can't say this stuff. Can, can I just say it my way? And the director is going to go, yeah, it's just the writing. You know, sure. <laughs> you know, um, and you know, and he's right. It, it, you know, it, it, movies are not about writing. They're they're about the faces. They're about the voices. And and a director will get a better performance out of his actor if the actor says something that's perhaps not as pretty as it is on the page. But the actor will get into it more if you let him say this. And that and that's that's going to make it. Um, I mean, I did get. You know, I was my my daughter's here, and I was embarrassed like this, but. I mean, the, I, when, I, when 
when she was like four or five, um, I uh, was writing Clockers, uh, the novel, and you know it's all this like you know motherfucker is, and and I'm in I'm in my room, my workroom, and my door is open, and I'm writing dialogue between like Strike and Rodney, and you know it's like. Fuck you! I'm gonna fuck you. It sounded like you know, like a Wu Wu Tang backdrop, you know, <laughs> to his song. And I, I'm really getting into it. And I'm writing, and I'm just like, you know. And all of a sudden, I look up, and she had a play date. And there, uh, and th there's like two four-year-old girls that are standing there holding hands, and they can't move. You know, uh, Hi there, you know. And I, eh, close the door. And the next day, I got an office in the Brill Building. But I was so terrified that that kid was going to go home and say, um, Jen's daddy says he's going to fuck me up. You know, <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> you know, so, you know, and listen, if there are actors in here, too, it, you know, it, it's the same thing with, you know, in terms of getting performance. You know, it's like just relax and just let, let the, you know, let the people that you're playing get under your skin. You know, it, it, what's true for writers is true for actors is true for anybody. You know, it's like, you, you know, you, you, your soul has just got to be engaged in what you're doing. Otherwise, it's just chopping wood.